So good afternoon, everyone, and hello, Promise Advocates. I want to welcome you to our monthly gathering to celebrate you and to reach our goal of quality, affordable childcare for all Virginia families. My name is Krista Jones. I'm the director of the Virginia Promise Partnership. And I have to start off by saying that we, once again, I just, I want to keep reiterating this. We are so thankful for you. As we reflect on 2021, I hope that you all realize the role that you played in getting us where we are today with child care and early childhood education. In the last 18 months, we've seen significant investments in child care at the federal and state level and in the private sector. Our movement has momentum and we have heard each of you loud and clear. We have heard you say that child care is simply too unaffordable that we need quality, we need access, and we need to build and support our early childhood education workforce. As the political situation changes, many of you have also asked, what's next? How can we make sure we stay on course with all this momentum that we've built up, built up over the last several months? The Virginia Promise Partnership team has been working hard to communicate our priorities to the current governor, while also working with our incoming team to make sure that early childhood education is a priority. And today we're going to talk about how exactly do we communicate that. You are all living this day to day and you are definitely our best advocates. We know that advocacy can seem daunting, but you should know that we are in this together. Our goal is to provide the trainings and resources that you need to make sure legislators, the public, the media, and other stakeholders understand the realities of our current childcare system in Virginia. So today, as you listen to this conversation and also participate, think about how you can translate your daily realities in a way that legislators can understand. As we've discussed, facts are great, but we want you to focus on telling your story. In terms of themes, some people have also asked about what exactly should we focus our messaging on. So we definitely, like I just mentioned, we want to focus on access. How do we make sure that childcare is accessible for Virginia families? We also want to focus on affordability. How can we make sure families can afford childcare? We also want to focus on quality. What needs to be done to ensure that child care that is offered is quality child care and how we, how we continue to show that there is quality existing already and our workforce. Our economy is built on child care and a strong child care system is critical to ensuring that we can get people back to work. And underlying all these themes is parent choice. Parents should be in control, in control of their child's early childhood education experience. So today, I am pleased to have my friend, Kevin Boston Hill, today uh, here to sh share some tips and strategies on how we can communicate our message. So we will be doing an interactive exercise today, and I'm going to need a volunteer. So if you're willing, please put that in the chat. But before we move forward, we do have a trivia question for you. So this is an open-ended question. We usually do multiple choice. So I just want whoever can give me, it's whoever gives the closest answer to the correct answer first. So the trivia question is simple. What is VQB5? Has anyone ever seen that? Does anyone know what VQB5 is? If you do, put that in the chat. And the, the prize is a Virginia Promise Partnership prize pack. Virginia Quality B5. Okay, excellent. Can you tell me a little, can anyone tell me a little more? B is birth, great. Anything else? That's good, that's correct, that's definitely correct. We just wanna see if we can get some more. Any other details about it? Doesn't have to be too long. High quality care for early education, absolutely. So that is Gina who will, be, who will receive our prize pack today, very good. And just for a little information, the Virginia Department of Education is leading the implementation of this measurement and improvement system, which we call VQB5, which focuses on the quality of all publicly funded birth through five classrooms and supports families to choose quality programming across different program types. So thank you very much for your participation. And now I'm excited to introduce Kevin Boston Hill. So Kevin has spent over 20 years working with students, parents, and educators in school districts all across the United States. So he really is the perfect person to have this conversation with us today. 
because he is a public speaking coach, but he is an educator as well. And so through his interactive workshops, he has shared practical and proven strategies for educators so that they can take away what they need and, use, and effectively use this in their classrooms and with students and can apply it to their lives. Kevin is currently a college professor and teaches public speaking, interpersonal communications and presentation skills. And he believes that where there is a will to change, there is a way to change. And all it takes is that will to change and the right person to show them the way. So thank you so much, Kevin, for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So our first question is, for the advocates on the call and the, for those who are listening, we're often placed in a lot of different situations. So sometimes we may have to have conversations over the holidays with our relatives about childcare and what we do. Or we may in next year for our lobby day, and I know everyone is gonna be at our lobby day in February, we may have to talk to our legislators or the, a journalist may call. So how do you frame what you want to convey? What are the things you can, should consider when you're putting together your points for a child care story? Well, when you're trying to convey a particular story, that's the first thing you need to do, figure out what your story is and what is your ultimate end game. When working with teachers, I often tell them when you're putting together a lesson plan, you always work with the end in mind. And I think that's actually one of uh, Stephen Covey's um, habits of seven habits of highly effective people. You, you begin with the end in mind. So what is it that you want to get out of it? What's your overall purpose? Kind of work your way backwards and, and thinking about who is it that you're going to be speaking with, what their background is what your personal background is, what your relationship is to the audience, because you wanna really be audience centered. And so when you start to think about those things, you think about what the audience needs are, you think about um, what your particular desires are, again, what that end goal is, and you see how you can get those things to marry together and build on the relationship whatever that relationship is, even if it's a, a complete stranger, there's something there that you want to find that, that connection with, that common point, the common point of interest that you want to develop. And then you kind of build from that. And so once you get all of your, you get your story together, then you figure out how do I begin? What's my entry point into getting into this story? How, and then how am I going to carry it through? So what are those different steps along the way? Uh, I, I often use the analogy of the tour guide or the bus driver, because whenever you get on a tour bus, you, the guide tells you first, basically gives you an overview of what it is that you're going to be doing for that particular trip. And then as you get to each stop, they preview each stop. This is what we're going to see when we get to this person. And then when you get there, you go into a little bit more detail. So that's kind of how you want to approach this. What is, you give a general overview of what your overall plan is, or even if you get that in your head, and then how are you now going to break that down? And you break it down into little pieces, because that's how we remember things. It's easier for people to remember when you chunk it, as opposed to trying to give them the whole thing at once, right? What the old joke is, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. So you have to do it, you chunk things down and then people are, it's easier for them to remember. So those are some great tips. And as we ask people to give their childcare stories, sometimes, and we'll talk about impromptu speaking a bit more in a second, but you know, I feel like I can just see people's like eyes blaze over and they're like, okay, where do I start? What do I do next? Do you have any more um, recommendations for how to provide that structure to your remarks or to your um, child care story? Well, see, child care, when you start talking about that, that's a, a that's like one of those hot button topics that everybody can relate to. So you already have your relatability factor built in with that. Now it's, okay, where do you want to begin? And what type of story do you want to tell? So you want to always begin with some type of anecdote, some type of personal story, again, to personalize the interaction. 
How does how has child care affected you? How is it going to affect affect or impact the people that you're speaking with? So that you kind of give them that that story or that image to begin with, and it might be even be something that's really shocking that you know and that during this something like and during this pandemic, we know that a lot of families are, are having difficulties with getting childcare for their children. Uh, they, they want their children to be in school while they can go to work and if they can't do that. And you see how many people can relate to that. You may even ask questions like that rhetorical questions, raise your hand if, you have, if you're having difficulty with finding adequate childcare for your, for your child. Raise your hand if you had to take off work in the last couple of weeks because your child was sick and they couldn't go into school or they were exposed to somebody who has COVID and couldn't go back to school. It's like those type of rhetorical questions. Then from there, now that you have established that commonality, from there, now you start to deliver some solution steps some, or some possible solutions. And so when you start talking about having to take that time off, well, you know, these are some of the things we can do to lobby our, our local Congress people so that they can get some additional funding to help or enact legislation that will enable us to be able to stay at home and have our children in school or to enable us to get on a voucher system where we can um, afford uh, health care for, for or not only health care, but also the supervision for our children while we, while we go off to school, those types of things. One of the, just to give you a quick example, I did a, as part, in part of my radio show that I do up here in New York, uh, I interviewed a couple of people with the Robert Wood Johnson, which is a foundation based out of New Jersey. And their whole goal right now is, or their focus is to lobby politicians to enact some of that legislation to help with the healthcare issues, especially when it comes to child care. And, and so they've, they've given some tips and strategies on how parents can do just that by lobbying your local congressman, by putting pressure on the local CBOs or, or community-based organizations so that they can also join in that particular push and in that fight. Because the money is out there. There's definitely money out there that can be, that grants can be written for to enable those CBOs to open up their doors for additional child care resources. They just have to know where they are, where to find them and how to write for them. So if the, so if the parents can really get this grassroots effort going, then that's something that they can do. So when you're putting your particular story together, you start with that, commun that community building example that's going to get that connection. Then you, give, then you start to give some of those solution steps or possible solution steps that you think will work to help galvanize people towards your particular goal. And then you wrap everything up. You, you revisit that opening story, but with the brighter ending. So that again, it, it creates that full circle moment that shows people that okay, we had, we struggled at the beginning these are the steps we implemented to correct that struggle. And this is the positive outcome that we experience because of it. Excellent. That is really helpful. I just want to remind everyone that we will have an exercise I'm about if no one volunteers in the chat, I'll have to call on someone. So please, it will not be, it'll be very, it'll be painless. It will not be hard. We just want to practice our messaging. And, you know, that's really key. Some of the things that Kevin said. So from the, first, um, from the first moments when you started speaking, definitely remember your audience. Think about who your audience is. And as we said, we know that we're gonna have a lot of different people we need to talk to. It may be a neighbor, it may be a legislator, it may be a journalist. So first you wanna know that. Then he talked about the structure of your story. So the community building and talk about how this issue affects me, how it affects you. And obviously that might change based on the audience. Think about solutions and then work towards a brighter tomorrow. So if we do all of this, what are the actual outcomes that we will see? So I want you all to kind of be thinking about this. I know we've asked you several times to do your childcare story, but I really want you to continue to think about ways to, to evolve your story. So Kevin, a lot of times, and, and hopefully this won't happen too much, but sometimes we are in situations where we talk to people who do not agree with us. And sometimes we can be really, really passionate about the issue 
and we might be inclined to get angry or mad or lose our cool. When, when we start to feel ourselves doing that, how, what are some things we should consider? I'm glad you asked that question because that happens, like you said, it happens to all of us. We're, we're only human. And when you get very passionate about a particular topic, it's only natural for you to, to really personalize it. And that's, the, and that's where we have to remember that distinction. We have to remember to separate the personal from the message so that we don't get all wrapped up in that. And I know it's kind of difficult, but what, this is what we can do to remember this. Since we want to become, once we get upset and we get all emotional that way, now we're becoming more um, self-centered as opposed to audience-centered. And since we are becoming self-centered in this case, I came up with this acronym called BRAG, because now it's time for us to brag on ourselves, right? So, and what BRAG stands for is to breathe, reflect, accept, and be gracious. So B is breathe, R is reflect, A is accept, and the G is for being gracious. And this is what I mean by that. When you start to feel yourself get really anxious and get upset and get angry and so forth, just take a step back and breathe. And the deeper, the better. Because when we start to get emotional, our breathing becomes shallow. And then we start to run out of breath as we're talking and, and our, even our voice may actually go up a couple of octaves because we're running out of breath. So when you want to calm yourself down, you, you know, you breathe in, you, you breathe deeply, get that deep diaphragmatic breathing going so that you can, you can really calm yourself. Then what you want to do is reflect, right? Remember your purpose. What is the purpose of this conversation that you started? so that you don't allow yourself to go down that rabbit hole of emotion and getting upset and all and yelling and saying things that you may regret at some point, because that's going to just undermine your message anyway. So reflect, remember what it is, what your purpose was for being there and having this conversation. And then you want to accept, you want to accept the person for who they are, accept their opinion for what it is. And just know that they may not have the same level of education or the same background that you do, background knowledge on this subject that you do. So therefore, they're coming at this from a different perspective. And you need to be accepting of that. Or even the situation that you're in. Be accepting of the environment. Be accepting of what it is that you're walking into. Some things that you just cannot change, right? We want to have the... the I guess the, the, the wisdom to understand what we can change, what we can't change, right? So that may be one of those things you just can't change and we need to be accepting of that and it's okay. And then of course you wanna be gracious. You always want to have that smile on your face then when you're in these conversations with people, no matter how upset you may get. And then because kindness is always gonna be disarming in these situations. When you're constantly throwing kindness back at people, they're going to, you know, they're going to take it in a particular way because they're expecting you to be at, at 100 just like they are. And if you come at them at a much lower level, then it's going to disarm them a little bit and then they'll start to come down. As um, Ms. Obama used to say that when they go low, we go high. That's basically what it means. You have to be gracious to a point, almost to a fault. So that because that graciousness is going to be disarming to your opponent or to the people that you're speaking with. Those are excellent tips. Everyone remember brag, breathe, reflect, accept, and be gracious. Excellent. So are there any other tools like vocal variety or gestures or anything else we can do when we're speaking to help us get our point across? Well, of course, those, those are parts of your, what I call your speaking toolkit. And we all have one, we just have to develop it. And some of the elements of that toolkit are, you wanna remember your, your, your timber, your timber rather, which is the, the sing-songingness of your voice. You know how that roller coaster effect so that you're not speaking at one level, you're not speaking monotone. Because what happens, you think of, the, of a person, think of when, you, when you're hooked up to that electrocardiogram. You see it going up and down, that little blip going up and down, what is, and that signifies that you're alive. 
when it is like when it's flat lines, <laughs> you're dead. And you don't want the sound dead when you're speaking. So you don't want to be monotone. You don't want to sound robotic. You want to sound like you're really into this. And so that's how you have that little roller coaster effect of, in your voice. Use your gestures, use your body. That's what it, we're, we naturally speak with our bodies, with our hands. You, just, you probably see me on the screen now using my hand gestures a lot to make emphasis in, and so forth. Do that. Let your facial expressions show exactly what it is that you're trying to talk about. If you, when you get to that point where you really want to be sincere, your eyes are going to tell the story. And because you can always say things, but your, your face is going to always go against if you're trying to be different. Your face is going to really reveal what it is that you, you really feel. So let, use that to your advantage. So using your, your, your expressions, using your hand gestures, using your voice, letting it flow a little bit. And one other thing that people tend to forget about, but it's a very powerful tool, is pause. Just stop speaking for a moment. Let that silence wash over you. And pause does a couple of things. One, it allows everyone to allow what was just said to sink in, especially when you want to, when it's something that you said is that you know is really important and you want it to hit home hard. After you say it, mic drop, just stop. And then it sinks in, people actually think about it. It's like, oh yeah, that was, that was deep. Yeah, I like that. And then you speak and go on. Pausing also allows you as the speaker to regain your thoughts, right? To gather yourself, especially after you've heard a question. When you, somebody gives you a question, you wanna take your time to actually think for a moment before you speak. And this is good for interviewing, for any type of impromptu situation or anything like that. So that use of pause becomes extremely important. So when, again, when you go back to that speaker's toolkit, you have pause, you have the, timbre or the sing-songingness of your voice you have or the vocal var variety um, you have the your your facial expressions and your deep breathing and, and all of that your body expressions all of those things together help to really convey a really good a really good message whether a positive one and you are able to maintain the engagement factor in your audience those are really helpful. I know for me personally, my face always gives away what I'm thinking. So I know a lot of us need to work on that as well. Thank you, Kevin. And so before we get to our interactive activity, we just have one more question. A lot of times we will not be able to prepare for when we went, we need to give our story. Do you have any tips for impromptu speaking? Tips for impromptu speaking. Now, that term itself tends to frighten a lot of people. It's like, oh my God, I have to speak off the top of my head. I, have, I don't have anything prepared. Well, here's the thing. Impromptu speaking, extemporaneous speaking, however you want to term it, it's what we call limited prep speaking. So you still have a certain amount of preparation time. It may just, it's just not going to be the, the weeks or months that you would normally use to prepare to write things out. You now, you, now that time is truncated down to mere seconds. And you have the time. And that's why I say use that pause. The pause will help because once you hear that question, you take your time, then you start to think, okay, what are the experiences that I've had that I can apply to this question? And that's what it's about. You have all the resources that you need to go into any type of impromptu situation. It's called life. So your life experiences, the books that you've read, the movies that you've watched, any of those things can be part of your answers to any impromptu question that you receive. Here's an example. When you have, when you watch any of the town hall meetings that politicians have, do you really think that they have the exact answer for every question that comes from the floor? No, they don't. Un unless they've actually fed those questions ahead of time, which we think we're hoping they're not doing, they really don't know what questions are coming at them. 
But what they have done is they've created this like this mental file cabinet of different examples that they can use. And then when they hear a particular question, they quickly thumb through that file cabinet and say, okay, what example, what anecdote can I use to apply to this question? So it may not be a clean fit, but they try to do it as clean as possible so that it does answer the question in some sort of way. Because even when you start to hear the answer, the response, you say, that doesn't really answer the question that was asked. That's because they're already, they try to think of a way that they can use their information, their prior knowledge to, to feed into that particular question. Sometimes it's like fitting a square peg into a round hole, but it's, it's something that works. At least it gives them some sort of answer that they can use. So develop your own mental file cabinet of examples and then truly listen to the question that's being asked, quickly thumb through as you're, as you're being silent, and then apply that particular uh, response to that question. I love that. Thank you so much, Kevin. We do have a question in the chat, but this is what I'm going to do. So Monica Jackson, if you are still available, you're going to be our volunteer. So I'm going to read Monica's prompt. I'm going to, and we're going to, while Kevin is answering the question in, in the chat, Monica will have a few minute, moments to prepare for her response based on everything we've discussed today. So Monica, this is your prompt. You were talking to a legislator who is not in favor of changing the current child care system. What do you say to convince them? So think about all the things we talked about today. We've talked about audience. We've talked about, you know, talking about our perspective and then their perspective. We've talked about brag. So you're going to need to use brag in this situation. You know, remember, breathe, reflect, um, accept, and be gracious. Um, so Monica, that is your prompt. And while you are thinking about that, Gina has asked a question. Gina says that... Um, do you have tips for the introverted person? Oh, shoot. I think she said when her heart jumps out of her yeah. chest when she speaks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, see, I see the question. Okay. The introverted person that your heart kind of jumps out of your chest when you're put on the spot to give some type of, of speech or asked to speak. I get this question a lot. A lot of my students will come up to me after class and with just this question, this scenario. And this is what I, what I tell everybody is, Going back to some of the tips that I just gave you, one is breathe. Above all else, breathe. It sounds like it's a simple thing, and it's like, well, don't we do that automatically? Well, yes, we do, but, at, but there are times where we tend to forget to breathe, and so that, again, that breathing becomes very shallow, and you start to get, you, see, you hear it in your voice, and you may even get a little lightheaded because you're not taking in enough oxygen because you're not breathing deeply enough. So first thing is you want to breathe. Then you want to again think about what it is that you want to actually say. Just because you are put on the spot does not mean you have to answer immediately. You have time. Use that pause. Pause is a very powerful instrument. As people, though, we tend to believe that every moment of time that we in an interaction has to be filled with some kind of utterance. That's why we have these fillers, the ums, the uhs, the oh, you know like, and, and those types of things. Because we're trying to fill in that space. I tell people the only time that dead air is bad is when you're on the radio, right? because you're losing advertising dollars and stuff like that. When you're face to face, use that pause, because now that shows that you're thinking. It shows that you've actually absorbed the question and you're really trying to understand it to a degree that you can give an intelligent response. Then again, you just settle yourself down, you breathe, then you reflect on some of that information that you already have that can fit that question. You accept the situation for what it is. It, yes, it's limited prep, you're short notice. Okay, you can't do anything about that. Just accept it and let's move on. And then as you're giving your response, be gracious, smile. There's, that smile goes a long, long way. People become entranced with your smile. People become, because when they see that you have this, this glow about you, then they are, they're willing to act, they lean forward a little bit more because they want to hear what you have to say. And, and they know that you're very passionate about what you're talking about. So they want to hear more. 
And so those are the things, again, using brag, you want to definitely use those elements so that you can pace yourself and that you can center yourself into the conversation that you're having. But it, above all else, just begin to breathe and make sure that you know that you have what it takes. You have the background knowledge and information that it takes to answer that question. Because otherwise, no, they wouldn't have asked you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kevin. Okay, Monica, so your prompt is you're talking to a legislator who is not in favor of changing the current child care system. What do you say to convince them? Yeah. Thank you, legislator. Uh, thank you, legislator. Me today. I'm so excited to share my story with you. I've been doing child care for both and one thing I will tell you that I've noticed is that we have an opportunity with these kids to shape the nation's future. We are laying the foundation uh, for the next generation. Uh, you represent us and we're dependent on you to give us the resources that we need. Uh, parents are out working on a day-to-day -day basis. And you know, if they were not in the work Force, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Uh, we do everything possible as a nation to support businesses and industry. Business and industries are made up of individuals, individuals that have families. And we cannot expect the families to be functioning at their very best when they're not at ease with their safety and the well being of their children. Um, I know how you, you're position is on this. And I just ask that you just look at it a little bit closer as to why we are where we are. And the pandemic has shown that we cannot go um, and continue the process that we've been going. We have to make a change. That change needs to start with the foundation. We are building the nation future, but we are building the most important. It's not mortar and uh, break, it's human lives. We have windows of opportunities where we can get these kids ready so that they can succeed. Uh, from a financial standpoint, we know if we invest in these kids right now, that it's going to come back to us. In some cases, uh, 17 or 18 percent more when they are adults. It's versus going in the industry or going into education. We are raising the nation's future and you have, you're in a prime position that you can orchestrate all of this. Uh, just looking at, all I'm asking is for you to look at the data and to see what the research shows in terms of the early childhood. The pandemic is also an experience that we can go to. We don't need to go very far because we see without the support of early childhood that this nation, it cripples the economy. And this is an area I know that you're really interested in. So I ask that you just look at that carefully. I'm here to help as much as I can. Uh, I know this is just a brief conversation, but I would leave you with the thought that it is our nation's future. We are raising the next generation. You have a vital role that you can play in shaping that. And I would love to be able to work with you on that. I don't know what else to say. Excellent. Thank you, Monica. What is your feedback, Kevin? And I'm looking in the chat and, and I have to agree with Vanessa. That was a great job. Definitely a great job. And one thing that I may even do is actually lead with all of what his what that particular uh, politician's role is. Lead with that. What his that he plays a vital role in changing the the course of healthcare and and of childcare and so forth, because that's your biggest weapon. When you get into politicians, love talking about themselves and they all love talking about what they do and, and everything. So and it's not a bad thing. And that's how they get their voice out there. So you want to play on that and lead with that by that example. And then you get into 
uh, and I like the way that you've you couched it with we would love to work with you on how we can do this because you then you it's about we it's about how we can all do this together because there was one piece at the beginning that I would tell you to leave out and that's when you said that you work for us or something to that effect you you represent us and so mm -hmm. forth and so on mm -hmm. they hear that all the time politicians hear that every day and don't you think they're sick of it because it reminds them or it seems to them that they're being scolded almost mm -hmm. that you got to remember you work for us and you need to do what we want you to do type of mentality and so that remember be gracious right we want to disarm them so we don't want them to feel that they're on the defensive but instead you always want to couch your your conversation with how we can do this together and the families, the parents, the caregivers have done all that we can do or all that we know how to do, but you are in a particular position to carry us a little bit further. So we're coming to you now to use your resources to help us get to where we want to go. And I think when you couch it in those terms, then it'll, it'll make your story that much stronger. I like the way you, you closed it you close your story the same way you began it. And again, you bring that whole thing full circle. You just close that circle on them so that they can see what the, what the need is, what the families and caregivers have done to this point and how far they can go. And then what your role is to help us move forward in, in increasing the resources that are available so that it brings us back, it closes that circle again. So that's, I think that's perfect just tighten that up a little bit just think about the actual flow of your speech because there was a little circular discussion that took place in there as well but otherwise great response and, and great job thank you so much for that feedback kevin and monica thank you so much for participating excellent excellent job so our session is over for today but we have one more trivia question and anyone who has been listening should get this pretty easily. What does BRAG stand for that Kevin just talked about in his presentation? Who can, and the person who selects that, oh, puts the answer in the chat first will get um, a Virginia Promise Partnership prize pack. But just huge thank you to Kevin once again. Um, that was fabulous, fabulous advice. I know that everybody took away a lot of lessons from that and we'll be able to use that um, as we move forward with telling our childcare story. And I want everyone to make sure to watch their emails for future sessions. We plan to also have another conversation actually on next Friday. Um, we'll be talking to David Carey with the governor's office and the Department of Education um, to talk about what's in the governor's budget. So as most of you know, the governor will release his, Governor Northam will release his budget next week. So we'll have a conversation about that. So I can't tell, has anyone put an answer into the chat? It looks like Michelle got it. Michelle Lester. Okay, excellent. Okay, excellent. Bragg, Great job, Michelle. Once again, I'm sorry. Once again, Bragg stands for breathe, reflect, accept, and be gracious. Perfect. Well, thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank you for thank you, Kevin, as well, and have a great weekend.